Um, first, a response to the thing about meaning. I think you're absolutely right. And sometimes uh, what's both revolutionary and essential is uh, recapturing the place where we find the sense of meaning. You know, so if the meaning uh, we derive from a job, say, is in metrics, you know, this many people uh, found homes, you know, or whatever. That's one thing, but if the uh, sense of meaning we get derives from our own motivation, like, I, I listen that much more carefully, or I resolve to uh, really treat everyone with respect, no matter whether they're a client or a customer or whatever. Um, that's a very different source. And it, it's a very different result. Because even as we work toward those metrics, because that's the job, um, there's so many other factors involved. That So, for example, when I, uh, is after I wrote Real Happiness at Work, I was doing a workshop somewhere and somebody raised their hand. And she said that um, she was, uh, she worked in a call-in center feeling, fielding customer complaints. And she said, I love my job. <laughs> and, and she said, because I decided to love everybody. Good call. She said, I treat them all with respect. And I can't always help people. By the time they get to me, they've talked to two or three other people. They're completely freaked out. She said, but I treat everyone with respect. I really am honest. If I say I'll get back to you at 2 o'clock, I'll get back to you at 2 o'clock. And she just went on. She was like radiant. And I was like, wow. I, I think it, at the time of the workshop, I had just recently been a complaining customer uh, myself. You know, and It was not that kind of exchange. And, and yet, you know, here it is. Like a job that very possibly was not her dream job. You know, she was finding that sense of meaning in, the, in what she was bringing forth in it. So I think that's really true. And I think, you know, in terms of the questions you ask, it's like, it's made much easier when there is some kind of collective uh, work, either at the workplace or amongst people with the same values, or, you know, if there's leadership at the workplace that is um, encouraging those kinds of questions. Uh, because it's it's a process. Um, there's, uh, I mean, there are many times in my own life, and certainly some significant times, where I've been trying to figure out how to help somebody, for example, and, um, and there was one time where I was uh, in that situation with a friend who <clears throat> was really very kind of endlessly depressed, although uh, he's much, much, much better now. Um, it seemed like that day would never come. And I went to a Tibet teacher of mine, Sonia Rinpoche, and I basically said, how can I help him? And his advice more or less was stop trying, just be there. And it was very interesting because it didn't mean, and this is very subtle, you know, it didn't mean give up, it didn't mean ignore him, it didn't mean stop visiting, it didn't mean any of the things we might take it to mean. It meant just be there. And stop trying to fix it and see what emerges out of that moment. And it was very interesting because I wouldn't just be there. I was in the hospital. And uh, it was interesting to see people come in out of like the greatest love, you know, and appreciating that. But sometimes there was a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of like, you know, take 15 drops of this tincture and you'll be fine in a week. Uh, which was also very generous, but I could tell the internal experience he was having was one of being pressured. What if I fail? What if it doesn't work? Then I failed you. Then I have to, you know, uh, which doesn't mean never offer the drops, but there are different motivations we have in the offering, and sometimes if we're just there, what emerges out of that togetherness is a more helpful kind of offering than, you know, and I've just seen that over and over and over again. So uh, it's very hard for us because the words imply give up, don't be there, you know, be there and think about your email instead of really be there or whatever. Uh, but
but it doesn't mean any of that. And so it is, that's why I said the collective, you know, it's like when people have that kind of experience together and can relate to one another, that is a very healthy, healthy way of understanding, well, you know, I went to that extreme, I went to the extreme. The other part, which, you know, I talked about earlier, um, is that it's very hard uh, to find a balance and to recognize that balance is important. So um, I was part of a four-year program for domestic violence shelter workers at this other uh, institute, the Garrison Institute, and we were bringing tools of yoga and meditation to frontline workers, and then uh, directors and supervisors or shelters were, were sort of wanting programs as well, so um, we started a parallel track. So it was somewhere in there that uh, the women, the people who were directors and supervisors, themselves came up with this phrase, which I really liked, which was a culture of wellness. They wanted to help establish a culture of wellness at work. And everybody, well, it was interesting, for everybody, that meant a physical space of some kind where people could just chill. But then there were things that were very different, you know, for each person. And, and the nature of the culture, the domain of the culture, might be your body and mind. It might be your desk. It might be your office. It might be your, you know, your entire workplace. So this one woman said, in that vein, you know, that effort to establish a culture of wellness, she said, I've decided that from now on, I'm going to take a lunch break. And everyone in the room who did not work at a shelter was completely aghast. We said, you don't take a lunch break? Like, is it in your contract? And she said, oh yeah, it's in my contract. It's never enough time. There's always somebody who needs me. There's always something going on. Everything is urgent. But, she said, I realize I can't go on in a good way unless I actually shift that. And I take a, a lunch break. So it was really interesting because we were meeting in between Treats, and so we got a chance to hear her, her, you know, narrative as it went on. So, the first time she came in, she said it didn't work. She said I closed the door, but somebody crouched down and looked through the keyhole. <laughs> so I was in there, so I didn't get a break. And maybe like three weeks later, she came in and she said it worked. I closed the door and I shut off the lights on <laughs> that lunch break. So I realized, wow, you know, most likely the most difficult point in that whole story was realizing it was okay to want that, to need that. You know, and then I don't know how much support she got for that, but she did it. Um, so it's something like that. Can you, can you mind speaking to what? Sorry. Um, what if